Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Hi, and welcome to episode 62 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Today, we're joined by dietitian Kelly Isaacson from Cedars Sinai. But before we get into today's interview with Kelly, I wanted to just remind you that the new round of the SIBO coaching program is back, which is super exciting. And this time round, you can join me for the whole program, or you can come and join me for individual sessions. Now, I'll tell you quickly who we've got coming in to support us with this round of the SIBO coaching program. We've got psychologist Dr. Vanessa Thiel, who talks about negative self-talk, negative mindset, something that's so common for us SIBOers, particularly when we've had this for a long time. Alyssa Tate, my very own therapist, is coming to talk to us about adhesions and visceral mobilization therapies and how we can treat our adhesions and assess them, understand if we've even got them. Dr. Jason Maisaki from Eight Hearts in Portland is joining us to talk about his approach to treating long-term chronic SIBO and how he works with his patients to overcome it. As part of the program, you also get exclusive access to my forthcoming interview with Dr. Mark Pimentel on hydrogen sulfide SIBO. And Dr. Megan Taylor joins us to talk about visceral hypersensitivity. Again, something that's so common for us with SIBO, but often not talked about enough. And this is where we experience heightened sense of pain and discomfort uh, through our bodies and our abdominal areas. Alongside these amazing sessions with these fantastic doctors, you also get access to our group coaching sessions where you get to meet other people just like you. And you have exclusive access to our private Facebook group, which is incredibly active and really supportive. And people often tell me it feels like they've got this wonderful SIBO family of people they know that they can rely on, they can lean into, that they're always there providing them support, guidance and encouragement to keep going. So you can find out more by heading to the show notes page from today's podcast, which is thehealthygut.co forward slash Kelly. And before we dive into today's session, I also wanted to do another quick reminder that we've got a future podcast episode coming up where I will be covering the second key pillar to health, which is all around nutrition. So if you have got some questions you would like me to answer Or if you would love to come on to the show and ask me your questions yourself, you can head to the show notes page, thehealthygut.co forward slash Kelly, and you can leave me a voice message and it will get played on the podcast. And finally, guys, I'm super excited to let you know there's a heap of SIBO and gut health events coming up over uh, the next month or so. And in fact, I'm coming to you from the USA at the moment. I'm in the States until the 17th of June. I'll be in Los Angeles and Portland, and I am attending the SIBO Symposium, which is going to be great. So I'd love to see you there. If you're going, do let me know. Um, And And if you're interested in attending the SIBO Symposium, then you can head to the show notes page, thehealthygut.co forward slash Kelly, and you can click the link there to find out more about that great event. I've also got some fun meetups planned. So if you've ever wanted to meet me in person, now is your chance. If you're in LA or Portland, head to our show notes page, guys. There's a link there so you can go and see all of the events that are coming up, and I would love to see see you in person. If you'd like to get access to the full transcription of today's episode, along with the show notes, then you can sign up to become a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast absolutely free. All you need to do is put your name and email address down and you will then be an official member of the podcast, which will give you access to the full transcription of every episode from season two. So head to thehealthygut.co forward slash 
slash Kelly and just pop your name and email address down and you will immediately be emailed with a link to access all of the transcriptions from today's show and everything that's coming up and has already been aired for season two. So let's get into today's episode. I sat down with dietitian Kelly Isaacson last time I was in the States and we caught up at her office at Cedars Sinai. She specializes in treating patients with digestive conditions such as inflammatory bowel diseases, IBS, and SIBO. She holds a BS in culinary nutrition and an MS in nutrition. She practices at Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, and she also serves as the, as the dietitian for the IBD Nutrition and Integrative IBD Subspecialty Program directed by Dr. Eric Vasiluskas. And I hope, Dr. <laughs> Eric, I have pronounced your surname correctly. Kelly is actively involved in nutrition research at Cedars and with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. She has spoken at both local and national level conferences on the topics of IBD, IBS, SIBO and other digestive conditions. So today we talk about the low fermentation diet that Dr. Pimentel talks about, who it's good for and why it's quite different to other SIBO diets how long we should be following it. We also talk about the pros and cons of restricting your diet and why and when we should be restricting our diet and whether we should be eating differently, whether we have hydrogen or methane dominant SIBO plus loads more. So I really hope you enjoy today's episode guys with dietitian Kelly Isaacson. Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast, Kelly Isaacson. It's wonderful to have you on the show today. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. We're going to be talking all about SIBO and uh, dietetics and nutrition or food, basically, on today's episode. And, and it is something that can cause us SIBO folk great angst when we get diagnosed with this condition and, and for many people put on a more restricted diet. I put a call out to my community and asked them for questions, which uh, I got a very large number of questions. So I'm hoping we can get through as many of them as today as we can. Um, but first off, we're going to start off with the Cedars-Sinai diet for SIBO, because that is one of the diets uh, that is prescribed to people with SIBO. And I'd love to um, have you talk a bit about uh, what the diet entails, uh, when or why somebody would follow it, and how long we might follow a diet like the Cedars-Sinai uh, diet. So the low fermentation diet is um, commonly used to help to manage bacterial overgrowth. It was developed by researchers here at Cedar sinai uh, Dr. Pimentel and his colleagues. And the primary goal of this diet is to limit foods that are poorly absorbed in the intestine to help to prevent bacterial overgrowth recurrence. Um, so it... it uh, emphasizes limiting those poorly absorbed sugars like lactose and really high fiber foods like multi-grain breads um, so that the you know these these foods will tend to feed bacteria and so if you limit these poorly absorbed sugars um, then the bacteria hopefully won't um, come back that overgrowth will um, hopefully not happen as quickly um, it's good for our IBS and SIBO patients, but we, we tend to recommend it after antibiotic therapy. Um, so it's more for like um, maintaining remission and again, helping to prevent that uh, recurrence, which we do find in patients who are just treated with antibiotics, you know, up to 40, almost 50% of people will have a recurrence of bacterial overgrowth within nine months. So it's really important that our patients have, you know, a dietary um, treatment an option for helping to prevent this recurrence. Um, it's different from other SIBO diets in that it emphasizes um, the fasting uh, period between meals. So um, we have this thing called the migrating motor complex, um, and it's basically a um, a wave, a cleansing wave that happens in our intestines, and that helps to prevent um, 
bacterial overgrowth from um, occurring. And so studies show that people with bacterial overgrowth have less pronounced cleansing waves. And so it's important that we do everything we can to help with our migrating motor complex and keeping our gut clear. And so um, the low fermentation diet does emphasize fasting for about three to five hours between meals um, just to help with that cleansing wave. Um, It's a little more liberal, um, so it's kind of more practical for my patients to implement in everyday life. They can go out to restaurants and not feel overwhelmed by, um, you know, um, or I guess not overwhelmed, but um, not feel as though they don't have any options to eat, right? So it's easier to to go out and socialize on the diet. And it's something that we recommend more long term, again, for preventing the uh, recurrence of bacterial overgrowth. You've touched on something that I think many people experience and that's that they feel often when they go on these restricted diets that life has ended. They can't go out and uh, attend social functions or catch ups with friends at cafes or restaurants like they once did. And and it can be very isolating when you're going through that phase if you've gone on to a strict low FODMAP diet, for instance, which can be very limiting. Um, I followed the biphasic diet, which in its first phase is very limiting. <laughs> um, if somebody's following another diet and they're in that kind of very restricted phase or perhaps they're reacting to everything and they have self-restricted um do you have any advice for them on how they can start to try and live live life again so outside of the low fermentation diet just on a restrictive diet for bacterial overgrowth in general or just yeah if they're just they're just uh really suffering with uh being very restricted with what they can eat Mm -hmm. yeah so food related quality of life is significantly impacted in IBD. And this is um, important because food plays such a huge role in our diet beyond just nourishment. You know, um, we uh, when we celebrate with friends, you know, food is kind of central to that celebration and food plays other roles in life that are very important. And um, when we're on restrictive diets, it does make it harder to go out and socialize and kind of be normal or act normal around uh, uh, people. And so what I would recommend is uh, meeting with a dietitian who can help you understand what your particular food intolerances are. Because do know that, you know, in the beginning of, you know, when you're first diagnosed with bacterial overgrowth versus after you've been treated, you know, your microbiome changes and foods that you might not have been able to tolerate before um, you were treated for SIBO or um, foods that you just feel like you can never tolerate again, that that may change over time. And so working with somebody can help you understand when it would be appropriate to kind of liberalize out what things you can try and what things would be safest to try. Just in regards to food intolerances, um, there's often some discussion in the online forums for that exist for SIBO around the validity of those testing. Are you able to talk to whether food intolerance testing is accurate, an accurate way to measure how a person responds to foods? Yeah, so the food tolerance test, they just don't give accurate, reliable, reproducible results. And so I at least see in my patients that those food tolerance tests can um, contribute to uh, financial burden and also food anxiety. Um, And so I... Think I I think the best way to tell if you have a food intolerance is to try a food and see how your body tolerates it. Usually if you give a food, if you're introducing a new food, we give it three days um, to see how that food reacts with your body. And I encourage my patients keep a food and symptom log because that's really important and try not to change anything else in your diet. If we're consistently seeing that a food is causing gas, bloating, you know, uh, excessive diarrhea or other issues, then we isolate that and see, is that your trigger and um, remove it from the diet and see if you, if um, you know, it helps to improve your symptoms. So I think that's the best way to understand if you have a food intolerance. So when you say um, over three days, is that, is uh, that that you will try, let's say carrot, <laughs> you want to try carrot and you haven't eaten carrot for many months. Uh, is it that you have it on day one and then you don't have it again for the next three days or you have it 
every day for three days. I know my listeners will be sort of thinking, how do I do that exactly? That's a great question. So I usually recommend um, if you're trying a food that you haven't had in a while to try a small portion, like maybe a quarter of a regular portion that you would normally eat for that food. So you try uh, a quarter or half a portion on day one. Uh, you listen to your body, listen to your your symptoms, uh, you know, try to be really mindful when you're eating. And then uh, on day two, if you don't have any issues, you can continue with that same dose or you can increase it to maybe half a portion or a full portion. And then you do the same thing on day three. If you are noticing that your symptoms worsen, um, you can always uh, cut back on the dose. So if on day two, when you've increased it, if you're being, if you're noticing a little of a little bit of an increase in your symptoms, you can cut back on the food portion and then try it again on day three and see how your body responds to that. It's not always the food that um, triggers symptoms in my patients. I noticed that um, dose is really important as well. So you might be okay with, say, you know, a quarter of an onion, but if you increase that to half an onion or a whole onion, that might uh, trigger a lot of symptoms. One thing that I hear from from people, uh, because I hear from people from all around the world who have SIBO, is often that they find it very difficult to connect the symptoms with what they're eating. Uh, they might have, for instance, been experiencing bloating every day for the past 20 years. So to them, they don't know they're bloated because that's just their new normal. If, uh, you know, you are there are people that are experiencing that where symptoms are occurring but they're just so tuned out to them Um, how can we start to tune back in that's a really important question I do see that quite often in my patients you know they suffer with these symptoms for years and they've really normalized them Um, I think it's important to um, you know see your practitioner regularly or if if um, you're experiencing something that um, you know, isn't normal for you to address those and try not to normalize them because it's very important to, to listen to your body um, because our bodies are uh, very receptive and they tell us when something's not right. And it's important to address that and, and not, you know, kind of um, ignore it. A question I often get asked is, should we be eating differently depending on whether we have a methane-based SIBO or um, dominant hydrogen-based, sorry, hydrogen-dominant SIBO or even hydrogen-sulfide SIBO? What's your thoughts on that from a dietary perspective? Well, the evidence supporting any one particular diet for bacterial overgrowth is lacking. So um, unfortunately, at this time, we don't have a diet for hydrogen predominant or hydrogen sulfide predominant or methane predominant SIBO. Um, But that's a great question. And in my clinical practice, I um, encourage a a, a diet to help manage my uh, my patient's symptoms. So it's it's about you know following those basic bacterial overgrowth um, you know guidelines like fasting between meals and limiting poorly absorbed sugars and hydrating and taking care of your body and limiting processed foods and food additives. Um, but it's um, also about treating your symptoms. So if you have diarrhea, right, are you getting the good sources of soluble fiber to help manage your bowels, um, non-fermentable soluble fiber? And same with constipation. Are you exercising? Are you hydrating? Um, so uh, beyond just the basic SIBO, um, you know, principles and guidelines, uh, we it's important to treat the, the symptoms that are associated with the methane predominant or the hydrogen predominant bacteria. What are some examples of some soluble fiber that someone with diarrhea might be able to um, incorporate? Soft cooked vegetables, right? So um, you could do green beans or soft cooked carrots or um, squash. Um, also soft cooked fruits. So fruits without the, the peel, just you, you want the, the inside of the fruit to help with that um, soluble fiber and help with managing your bowels without um, contributing too much to um, symptoms. Um, so applesauce or um, banana um, it really depends on which diet, like if you're on low FODMAP, then you can't have certain fruits or vegetables and uh, the same with low fermentation. But in general, you want to increase your intake of those soft cooked uh, fruits and vegetables and, and refined grains to help manage the bowels. There is a, a soluble non 
fermentable uh, fiber supplement that I tend to recommend to my patients who um, maybe aren't getting enough of that soluble fiber from their diet. Um, and it's called psyllium fiber and that can help. And it does not, again, it's not fermented by bacteria. So it can help to manage your bowels um, without contributing to uh, potential overgrowth. Something you just touched on is the difference between the diets. And I know for many patients, they they get told they've got SIBO. They get told there's a couple of different diets they can do. Then they go and research all of them and go into information overload. Uh, do you have any advice on what we should do when it comes to choosing a diet and uh, and perhaps getting overwhelmed by the variations between each diet? Yes, that's one of the many wonders of the internet, but also one of its huge downfalls is there's just so much information out there on, you know, diet for bacterial overgrowth, and there's so many different opinions. And like I said there, we don't have really strong evidence to recommend any one specific diet for bacterial overgrowth right now. So it is very individualized. I have, you know, many patients that I treat with with SIBO, and I don't think I mean, they might be on, they might be on the same diet. Like I might have quite a few on low FODMAP and quite a few on low fermentation or SCD, um, but they are on very different uh, variations of those diets. And so one thing that works for one patient isn't necessarily going to work for the next. And so that's where it's really important to talk to your GI practitioner, um, talk to your dietitian to help them so that they can help you develop um, and find what your ideal personalized diet is. I often talk about building a dream team of health professionals, that it's not just one person that can um, generally help us get through this, but many. And I have um, brought a lot of people into my own team, including support with my nutrition, despite the fact that I'm very confident in, in the kitchen. But I recognise that I don't, I haven't gone to university for all those years to study the qualifications to, to be able to advise on dietetics or nutrition. And I think having somebody in your corner that does know that has experience with SIBO is so beneficial because these diets are just guides at the at the you know for the starting point we really need to to work with our own unique makeup uh, to find what works for us and I know when I followed my SIBO diet the biphasic diet pumpkin and squash was allowed from the get-go and yet I could not tolerate it. It took me six months to be able to reintroduce that food back into my diet. So if I'd just followed the protocol, I would have been suffering every meal. I tried to force that food in and uh, it just wouldn't have worked. And that's a question that I had from somebody uh, saying that uh, she was following protocols and she was having these big reactions and she wanted to know, should she just force through those reactions, um, eat that food anyway because the protocol says that she she should or should be she should she be taking that food out of her diet because she's getting these intense symptoms from it that's a good question hey i've got loads more just like this coming up after this break we're back in a moment And that's a question that I had from somebody uh, saying that uh, she was following protocols and she was having these big reactions and she wanted to know, should she just force through those reactions, um, eat that food anyway because the protocol says that she should or should, be, she, should she be taking that food out of her diet because she's getting these intense symptoms from it? Wonderful. I love that dream team. That's so great. Um, you know, it's really important to have those different practitioners on your team because, you know, uh, doctors provide different things from dietitians, and the patient is really central and important part of that team because the feedback that I get from my patients helps me to determine where to go next when we're looking at modifying the diet. So no, you shouldn't really, you know, just suffer through and, and try to, you know, eat these foods that you're, you think you have to, uh, right? It should really be modified to help you through the healing process without contributing to symptoms. And so that feedback that I get from my patients helps me to guide them through 
through to the next, you know, well, this didn't work, so let's try this instead. And even though this is con supposedly considered safe, you know, it sounds like you might have an intolerance to this right now. So let's consider trying something else. So I think that's really important that the, the you know, and, and a really great point that you brought up about um, patients and, and their reactions to foods and and contributing that information to the team, to the dream team. The dream yeah. team. I love my dream team. Um, given that the kind of general consensus out there is that um, food alone doesn't cause SIBO, one of the questions I had from someone was, well, why do we have to restrict our diet then? So yeah, food uh, does not contribute to um, bacterial overgrowth, but it does contribute significantly to how you feel when you have bacterial overgrowth. And the rate of recurrence of that bacterial overgrowth, at least we, we think. Um, and we do know that, you know, when you have... Um, you know, bacterial overgrowth, there can be damage to the um, intestinal brush border. And so you can have less active disaccharidases or, you know, less active enzymes that help to break down um, lactose or other sugars in the diet. And so that might contribute to feeling uncomfortable. So, um, and then there is, there's also, you know, the, the, the study that was done a, a few years ago by Dr. Pimentel and his research team here are looking at the effect of at least elemental diet, right, and treating bacterial overgrowth. So they found that Vivanex was actually very effective in eradicating bacterial overgrowth when antibiotics hadn't been um, eradicated it in 80% of the patients in the trial. So um, diet makes a huge difference in not just how you feel, um, but also helping to modify the microbiome, um, hopefully to a more favorable profile. What we eat significantly and, uh, you know, uh, very rapidly will change our microbiome. And we see that in studies. Should we be staying on, on any of these SIBO diets for the long term? It depends on the SIBO diet. Um, in general, we want you to have as much variety in your diet as possible because that's what we know contributes to a nice, healthy microbiome. Um, low FODMAP diet is not meant to be followed long term. It's really a short term diet. And uh, after the elimination phase, patients are encouraged to reintroduce. Um, that often doesn't happen. And I see that um, quite frequently in my practice. Um, and that can contribute to micronutrient deficiencies, macronutrient deficiencies, as well as a reduced food related quality of life. Uh, low fermentation diet is kind of something that you can follow more on a long term basis, again, because it's a little more liberal. Um, and it's uh, a little bit more easy to do in in your life. Um, and then something like the SCD, there are general timeframes for that. Um, but do remember that our microbiome changes over time. And so, no, I don't think that any of these one diets needs to be followed uh, for long term or for the rest of your life. You know, if you're newly diagnosed with bacterial overgrowth, don't think that you have to be on the low FODMAP diet forever because you don't. So that's that's something that um, a lot of my patients actually look forward to is, you know, finding their ideal diet, liberalizing away from the restrictive diets and, and finding what works for them. And as someone who's experienced SIBO, um, and, and then has gone through a recurrence, I can talk to the fact that the first time I had SIBO, I, I was reacting quite severely to a lot of foods. This time round, I'm not. So it, even if you do relapse with your SIBO, it doesn't mean a relapse equals the same or the past experience. And I can now eat really broadly from a plant-based food perspective, whereas before I was reacting to a lot of different vegetables and fruits. So, it, you know, that just shows, I guess, my microbiome has really uh, changed since the first time around. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, it's great. It is yeah. really enjoyable to to. I really don't feel like I've got SIBO, um, other than a few, few symptoms that come here and there. But uh, it's a different experience to last time. Um, one thing that I was very scared of the first time I went through my SIBO treatment, and I know many people are, was the concept of cheating, going onto one of these diet protocols, slipping up going crazy, perhaps eating the more higher sugar or carbohydrate foods, and then feeling incredible remorse. Will we create uh, or will we uh, make our SIBO come back if we have one of these cheat meals, cheat days, cheat weeks, cheat months? <laughs> um, 
Well, I like to emphasize in my patients that, you know, food is nourishing and it's healing and you should never feel guilty about eating. Um, That being said, I encourage my patients to eat mindfully and I try to practice mindful eating. And, you know, if I wouldn't call it cheating, but if if you're craving something and you want something, I think it's important that you listen to your body and you satisfy that craving in um, a uh, meaningful way uh, without overeating and, you know, just just being really mindful when you eat Um, because again, food-related quality of life is significantly impacted in IBS and bacterial overgrowth. And the more we restrict our diet, the less quality of life we have. Um, So try not to think of it as cheating. You know, these things happen and um, that's okay. And enjoy it in the moment. And then get back to, you know, sticking with a diet for your treatment um, and try not to have guilt around it. What about sweeteners for those sweet truths out there that go, I just, how am I going to live a life without sugars? Are there sweeteners that we can be eating um, when we're, when we have SIBO and are there some that we should be completely avoiding? So a lot of the SIBO diets address this and it's different in each diet. Um, What we do know about sugars is that the uh, higher up the sugar is um, absorbed in the small intestine, um, the less likely it is to, you know, travel down the intestine and feed bacteria and contribute to symptoms and overgrowth. And so those simple sugars that are absorbed early in the intestine, in the intestine mainly come from like plain table sugar, um, brown sugar. Um, and then limited quantities of like sugar from fruit. So glucose and um, moderate intakes of fructose would be okay. Um, That being said, something like the SCD allows unlimited amounts of honey, which is not necessarily what I'd recommend for a SIBO patient. Um, And the low fermentation um, diet does recommend, you know, table sugar is fine, um, as well as aspartame if you... um, are looking for a non-caloric sweetener, but sugars that are poorly absorbed in the intestine are going to be your sugar alcohols, like anything ending in an OL, sorbitol, maltitol, xylitol. Those come a lot from diet foods as well as mints or gums. And so those definitely we do not absorb and they will contribute to symptoms. Um, And the other sugars like uh, sucralose that might contribute to bacterial overgrowth or symptoms as well as uh, stevia. So I encourage, you know, if you want to use a sweetener, um, try to use the simple sugars like the table sugar um, or the aspartame um, and honey in, in moderation. And before we wrap up, one of the other things that people um, experience generally, there seems to be two camps, those that are that lose weight, not wanting to lose weight, but they're really dropping weight. And those, which is the category that I always fall into, is the keeping weight on or gaining weight. Um, what do you, we'll start off with the people that are becoming quite underweight. Uh, do you have any advice on how they might be able to stem the flow of weight loss and try and get some weight back on their frame? And should they be thinking about the fasting and eating sparsely or should they be thinking about caloric intake and, and eating um, more frequently? So we never want um, any SIBO restriction to compromise nutritional status. So if you're following a a protocol and it's leading to weight loss and malnutrition, we really need to reevaluate the diet therapy plan there. Um, You know, I encourage to aim for those four to five, three to five hour fasting periods between meals, um, just because that's really helpful in preventing that recurrence of bacterial overgrowth. Um, But if you're not able to eat enough uh, during the day to gain weight, then we kind of need to, um, you know, maybe consider cutting back to three hours, you know, adding in an extra meal um, or increasing those really calorically dense foods like, you know, avocado or, um, you know, the vegetable oils um, or the other calorically dense fats (coughs) that you can have um, to try to maximize your intake. 
without contributing to your symptoms. So if you can, you know, fit in a, a fourth meal during the day and still have those three hour fasting periods, that's good. Um, but if not, you know, we really want you to get the calories in because that's what's going to help you overall. You know, if you're malnourished, you're not going <coughs> to you're not going to feel well or do well or heal as quickly. What about the people that were uh, like myself in that um, weight just piles on despite eating very healthily, really watching caloric intake and all the rest, and it just feels like there is no, it's like a crazed beast that just wants you to, uh, to be much larger than you want to be. What, what can those people be doing to help stem the increase of weight? So exercise is really important. It's not always about, um, you know, what you're eating. It's are, it's are you, you know, getting out and burning those calories. Um, also, uh, studies show that um, the types of foods that we eat can influence our microbiome and lead to bacteria that harvest more, you know, uh, of an ability to, to break down and absorb fats. So, and that's typically going to come from like a westernized diet, high in fat, high in sugar, high in red meat, low in fiber, um, so uh, low in fruits and vegetables. So uh, look at what you're eating, not just the calories, but the quality, and then try to make sure you're um, getting, you know, good exercise in, not just for weight maintenance, but for your overall health. It's something that I've really um, worked at over the years and uh, I find that making sure I get to sleep at a reasonable hour um, really important. has been a major factor for me in stemming the flow, as has successfully treating my SIBO. Um, that had a big impact on just being able to um, have some of the weight gaining that I experienced coming, um, just stemming that flow. Kelly Isaacson, it's been wonderful to have you on the Healthy Gut Podcast today. If people would like to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do so? I am active on Twitter. At My handle is at GI Dietitian. And I'd love to see you on the Twitter sphere and um, comment and follow along. Thank you so much for coming on and, and talking to us about diet and nutrition with SIBO. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Kelly is just such a wonderful and very informative person. I enjoyed chatting to her immensely. If you would like to get access to the show notes from today's episode, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash Kelly. And don't forget to come say hi to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, and Google+. Just search for us under The Healthy Gut. Coming up on next week's show, the incredible Dr. Stephen Sandberg-Lewis is joining us. And we're going to be talking all about functional gastroenterology. So I really look forward to bringing that episode to you next week. You've been listening to The Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about The Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening.